I've heard from multiple products and industries that, yeah, the free stuff is really where, where you make the money. I mean, there was a conversation at Facebook in the early days about how much you would need to charge the customer you know, in order to make it viable and to have ad free. And this, this was laughed off. Right? There's no way, there's no way those guys want it to be possible for there to be an ad-free version which is subscription-based. Welcome back to the Endless Coffee Cup. I want to thank you for making the time to download this episode, and I promise it's going to be an eye-opening episode. It's going to be well worth your time. I have, as my guest, a longtime friend, John Marshall, who has just recently written and published a book called Free is Bad. Uh, John, thanks for making the time to be on the podcast today. Hi, Matt. It's, uh, it's just great to talk to you again. Yeah, we've, uh, we've known each other for a long time. And uh, always enjoyable conversation. So I, I'm really grateful to you for taking the time. Absolutely. And uh, listener, just so you know, the, the, the relationship between John and I, I first met him at a conference where John was the CEO of an analytics company. And uh, I, I like to think I was an early adopter of uh, the analytics product there. And then we worked together at a training company. And I want to say, John, it's been almost 15 years, I think, that we have known each other uh, in this industry. I, 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 actually, I think it might even be a couple more than that. I mean, if I were yeah. really forced to think about it, I might say it's a couple more than that. But let's just go with 15. Okay, yeah, 15. Yeah, we're not that old. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Well, John, first of all, I, I think you have a fascinating history or a fascinating biography. I, I love to tell people when I'm talking about you that, well, you, you know, we'll find out. I would like to ask you first your bio, but I like to tell people you're the person who invented the blink tag in HTML, <laughs> right? That's what I've always heard about you. <laughs> it, it is an unfounded and vicious rumor, which uh, you, you can't prove it. <laughs> I can't prove that. Okay. All right. <laughs> well, John, give us a little bit of your background here, because I think it's a, it, it lends a very unique view of your book, Free is Bad. Yeah, Matt, thank you. I do have a little bit of an eclectic background for sure. Um, so I start, I, I, I did work at Netscape, just to put this rumor to bed. Um, <laughs> I did work at Netscape, you know, that very early browser company. And, uh, you know, I was an employee there. I don't want to make that seem like it was any kind of big deal. You know, I worked there, it was a job and you know I learned some stuff but one of the things that that came from that was sort of a curiosity about analytics and particularly small businesses and analytics and I've always had this um uh, I suppose this affinity for for small businesses and how they approach online marketing so you know came up with this product the one that you you've um, described there how we met that company was called click tracks it was a web analytics tool you can think of it as being google analytics before there was google analytics that's probably easiest way to describe it but it gave me this insight into how online marketing works on the web and how you measure that so that was that was sort of step one in my journey here after that, I sold that company, um, started a, an online training company, Market Motive. We sold uh, courses to teach, once again, small businesses, how to market online using all of these online marketing tools. And of course, the analytics was a piece of that. And naturally, I had some um, specialty interest in that. Uh, but, you know, the company taught all kinds of things, search engine optimization, page search, social media, all this kind of stuff. And we we sold those courses online as distance learning. And nowadays, I think that's become fairly common. But, you know, back in 2008, that wasn't as common. And it was, you know, it was kind of a big deal. And then we sold that company. Uh, and so the, the third step was, I mean, in my journey here um, was algorithmic ads. That is, again, a small business focused product. And it was focused on display advertising, the graphical banner ads, and mm -hmm. how small businesses could 
create those kind of ads very efficiently. Usually you'd need to hire a graphic designer and it's really complicated. So we used some, what they call artificial intelligence, some machine learning techniques and some other stuff. And, um, you know, that was an okay business. I don't want to say that that was the most successful. Actually, there were some problems <laughs> in that company, but that's okay. You know, I learned some stuff and I, I get to the end of that and like, wow, at the end of that process, I end up with, I know a thing or two about analytics. I know a thing or two about advertising online. And most importantly, I ran my own businesses. So I know a thing or two about economics. And that's where I sit today. That's kind of the background of where I am today. Wow. I mean, that is such a fascinating background. Um, and, you know, especially being involved in early Silicon Valley, uh, I'm sure you've seen and witnessed a lot of, you know, the evolution and the growth, not just of the industry, but of the area and everything around there. Yeah, it's been just amazing. Um, you know, of course, I'm originally from Britain. Um, I came to the Valley in 1992, May of 92. And I, I, I just I like, couldn't believe it. You know, just everybody was this hyper rational nerd just like me. <laughs> <laughs> You're among your people. <laughs> totally. Just just you you just don't know how at home I felt. <laughs> <laughs> so with all of that background, what was it that that made you want to write this book? What 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 was that seed that you you because when I read it, there's a purpose in mind. And so I'd love to know what what developed that in you. There was a couple of conversations that I had along the way uh, to do with privacy and uh, the way that we use the web. And the conversations often ended up with the statement somebody would say to me, well, information wants to be free. Hmm. And, you know, they, that's kind of an interesting thing to say. And it's, it's a founding principle of the Internet. So actually, Matt, let me let me ask you just for a just as a little digression for a second if i said to you that information wants to be free is the founding principle of the internet but i ask you do you know the other half of the statement and let me ask you do actually do you do you uh, know the other half of the statement you know i have heard that statement before and it's always interesting the context that it's been used but i can't tell you that i know the other half of the statement and that's okay. Hardly. <laughs> that's okay. Very few people do. But it, it just so happened that I, I did know, and I do know the other half of that statement. And in, I, we, will, we will explain to um, uh, our listeners, your listeners here, um, we will explain the other half of the statement. But, but just bear with me. Okay, let's, 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 let's keep people in suspense. And let's say at the, at the end, will reveal what the other half of the statement is. But back to your question, yeah, I, I would hear somebody say, well, information wants to be free. They also would say something like, I, um, I use all of these online services and I'm concerned about privacy. But then they would do nothing about it. This is really what I started to realize. Yes, yes. A complete resignation almost. Yeah, that, that, is, that is exactly the right word to use. That is exactly it. And, and yet, what I observed is myself personally, I am not concerned about privacy. And I started to think, well, look, everybody else is concerned here and I'm not. So what is it that they know that I don't know? Or what is it that I know that they don't know? <laughs> <Right>? <laughs> That's a great, a great way to start research. I love that. <laughs> yeah. Um, and I started to realize that I think I know something that lots of other people either don't know or don't want to know. Mm. And, and, and I've applied that pretty consistently through my, my career and you know, the way that I deal with stuff online. And I finally decided... Look, John, pretty clearly you're doing things different than everybody else is. So why don't you just explain to people what it is that you do and how it's different? I then thought, well, if, if I do that, that actually it's, it's kind of not interesting enough. I mean, it just sort of becomes a recipe and nobody really cares about that. So in order to make it more interesting for people, I decided that I would write some history 
that would explain why we have these privacy problems. Mm. Explain you know, why those companies that why there are these companies that are creating those privacy problems. So, like if you, if you like the economics part, where does the economics part come from? My own software engineering background, I can explain how a little bit, just a little bit of how some of this stuff works, so that it creates those economic incentives. And then I can just tell people, this is what I do to fix this particular problem, right? Ah. So the, in the end, that's what the book does. The, we, we take different online tools that we all use. I explain a little bit of history about that tool, just enough to make it interesting. I explain how the economics of that tool have created some of these problems. And then, hey, here's how I have fixed that particular thing in my life. We take email, search, social media, couple of other things and then finally news and um you know media is, is the, the biggest single chunk of the book yeah and that's it you take some very fundamental tools uh i, I mean that's it you, you, <laughs> it's not that simple john you you go after some very i mean i mean you're talking everyday tools i i, I made a quick list so you, you tackle email choice of browser search social media and i mean and news this is what most people do online every day you tackled the the major building blocks of someone's day or the major tool set and yet i i think what you're going after with the book is these are all things that are free and because of that there are some major problems here you went after some big boys here <laughs> <laughs> that's this isn't that's it you you took on some big big content areas as you as you point out, they form just such a huge part of our daily lives. And when I looked at the choices that I was making, I was surprised that not everybody at least thinks about those same choices. I mean, if, if we were to take, for example, search, mm -hmm. search is sort of fundamental to the way the internet works. And it's almost impossible to have search without advertising. And, and actually, the history of search is such that it's never really worked. Search paid for through anything other than advertising just hasn't worked. But Google isn't the only way that you can search. It's not the only thing that exists. It's not even necessarily the best thing that exists. <laughs> so, so if I said to you, I'll say to you, Matt, you know, here's a surprise. I don't use a single Google product. Well, actually, I will tell you from my perspective, I'm not surprised because I try to avoid using Google as much as possible. And, and this is something where I think we're very aligned. And I, I realized very similar to you uh, when I was doing my master's work and I chose media and information literacy as one of my content areas in my master's program. And in doing surveys of people about their views of search and some of these areas, that's where I came, that's where I realized people have an attitude of, well, they know everything anyway, and there's nothing I can do. And that was the overwhelming opinion. One of the things that really surprised me is those that self-assessed themselves as having a high level of knowledge about privacy about surveillance, about any of those things, they actually were the highest Google users. <laughs> and I often scratched my head at that as, well, wait a minute, how can you say you have such a high knowledge of this, but yet use Google everything? When I read your book, it was really with the anticipation of finally someone who understands this industry and and, you know, I, I'm all about helping you get the word out because, yes, I use a paid email service, basically Outlook uh, for business with my own domain. I mm -hmm. use a combination of Firefox and Brave. Once in a while, I'll use Edge. I've been really impressed with Edge. It's good. Uh, yeah, yeah, it's good. I've been surprised. <laughs> I try to avoid Google Docs, but yeah, I have clients that use it. And so I really, really limit that. And, and yeah, for search, I've been using a combination of Bing and DuckDuckGo, and I spread things out, I, I guess, is my strategy mm -hmm. across different platforms, different programs, not because I'm trying to hide anything, but because I frankly am fed up with ads. That's really where my, 
my motivation lies. So, so let me ask you, uh, just to complete the picture here, and this is going to be a very personal and intimate question. And I'm sorry. <laughs> what brand of phone do you use? I use an iPhone. Why? <sighs> that is a great, great question, because... I would say for the past few years, I've not been too happy. But I'll tell you, my number one motivation for using an iPhone is that it's not Android. <laughs> That's number one. I've become happier with Apple since they have started moving to an opt-in advertising operating system. When that gets fully implemented, I will be totally on board with that, where all advertising, all tracking is opt-in. Mm -hmm. The other thing is just the consistency of that. I've looked at other operating systems. You know, everything else is is Android operating system. I would say the lack of choices out there are what makes me stay that. But not being Android, that's my number one motivation. Right. So <laughs> it's an interesting question to always, I think, to ask people in this question of privacy, because there's only two choices. For most people, because we have this intimate relationship with our devices, um, you know, we go to bed with them, for goodness sake. Oh, yeah we kind of have an emotional response to that question, right? So now let's, let's, just, let's just dig into it a little bit more. If you want to drive somewhere and you don't know where you're going, you probably use some kind of mapping application, get directions and so on. And you probably do that on your phone if, if, if it's not built into your car. Yeah. What tool do you use on your phone? I use the Apple Maps <laughs> and I have not ended up in a lake or <laughs> in a dead end. I have I have always gotten where I need to go. So that's <laughs> Matt, as I would have guessed, you know, you've already figured this stuff out, right? But a lot of people will choose uh, to use an Apple phone. Um, they will, well, actually, they, let's start at the beginning. They will say, "I am concerned about privacy," and collection of data. They will make that statement. They then will choose an Apple phone, which is interesting because given the choice between Apple and Android, they're obviously one is going to have a different attitude towards advertising than the other. I mean, one comes from a company that makes its money from advertising, and one comes from a company that makes its money from just selling the phone. So right, it's yeah. this binary choice. And people for, you know, will say, I'm concerned about privacy. They then will buy an iPhone, which would seem to indicate, hey, you know, I'm buying an iPhone because I don't want the Android surveillance, as you've hinted at. And then the next thing they do is stick, <laughs> stick, stick Google Maps onto it. And not just Google Maps. They'll put the whole Google suite. Yeah. Uh, and then make Google the default search. Right. And you're right back in the system. <laughs> right. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> you're, you're maybe slightly better off than if you if you had just gone with android i mean you know android is is baked in at the operating system level there's stuff mm -hmm. happening at the os level that is pretty hard to get away from um but yeah this so exactly matt this always surprised me you know i would see people do this and i wondered i wondered why why is it that people will choose the phone that has a reputation for privacy and security and then stick the surveillance stuff on it. Why do people do that? I, I had the same question as far as a choice of browser, that the people in my surveys who rated themselves with the highest level of knowledge about privacy and security, overwhelmingly, they were Chrome users. And when I asked how many plugins that you have, it was close to 20 to 30 plugins. Wow. Wow. And, and I... You know, the, the contradiction there of your, you say you understand this, but you are doing this. So it's either resignation or an overestimation of my security knowledge. But you brought this up, and I think it's such an important thing to do. And I can't remember the number off the top of my head, but Google makes hundreds of billions of dollars. And I have to say that over 90% of it is from advertising. Right. So Google is an advertising company, whereas Apple, as you said, makes devices. And that's what they make it from direct sales. And so, you know, by offering all of these free tools, a browser, search, email, all these things, 
that's not how they make their money. They're not selling that. And that's why I was just like, when I got my hands on your book, I'm like, this is it. Because it's almost like you have to gently take people from point A to point B of, yes, this is free. Here's why it's free. And and the discussion of the economics behind it of you want free email, you you have to pay somewhere. You want free search, you have to pay somewhere. And you do a great job of bringing up some of these questions that I don't think people ask enough about their online experience. It's definitely in the media at the moment. There's discussion, of course, of a DOJ action against Google on antitrust grounds. It's not quite what we've just talked about there. It, it, it's sort of adjacent to what we've been describing there, but it's it right. you know it's definitely uh, something that could be happening. And there's even discussion uh, um, in, in some quarters of breaking up Google. And if the economics of that is something that I struggle with. But if we were to just for a moment suspend disbelief and say, okay, let, right, let's say that happens, what does the world look like? So, so a question that we need to therefore uh, answer is Google gets, break, gets broken up, whether we think that's good or bad, doesn't matter. And so what happens to Gmail? Right. And what I realized is the, the conversations that are taking place about, you know, whether Google is a problem, they only take us to the point of breaking the thing up, let's say. And I'm, I'm not, I don't mean to imply that I advocate for that or that my book advocates for that. It's just a thing that people say. But what does the world look like after that? So the, the obvious case, I think, is Gmail. It's like it's sort of the elephant in the room. And what do you think would happen with Gmail? H how would Gmail be both non-surveillance and free? How do you get both of those things? Right. That's the question. That's <laughs> the question. Well, and that's the thing. Independently, if someone were to buy this Gmail or, or take it over, they would have to right away decide on a business model, and that would be it. Do we continue being free, with which we then have to be ad revenue generated, and well, how are we going to do that? You know, Now we look at an ethical issue of how will we provide contextually relevant ads that people want to click on or want to see, or you monetize it by charging the users or charging per space or charging something like that. The economics are always going to rule it. I think what people don't realize, it, and, and this is what I, I've seen, as, well, especially in the app store, app developers don't want you to pay for the ad-free version <laughs> because they make more money with the ad-supported version. And I don't think people realize that. People, I think, are in this mentality that, oh, they want $6 for the app. Ah, no way. I'm going ad, ad support, and I can deal with the ads. But I don't think they realize how much money is made from the ad-supported versions. And the app creators are in love with their ad-supported versions. I don't think people can comprehend the amount of money that is driven by free email, free apps, free, you know, all those things. I, I think the economics of it is far above what, what most people would judge. Yeah. Um, I've heard from multiple products and industries that, yeah, the free stuff is really where, where you make the money. I mean, there was a conversation at Facebook um, in the early days about um, how much you would need to charge the customer you know, in order to make it viable and to have ad free. And this, this was laughed off. Right. There's no way. There's no way those guys want it to be possible for there to be an ad free version, which is subscription based. I do have to say that that Twitter on their corporate website a few months ago, they had a job posting for somebody with knowledge of um, subscription systems, an engineer with knowledge of subscription systems. And that kind of I think job postings is a really interesting way of seeing where companies might go. And so Twitter, to my mind, you know, my interpretation of that is they might in the future experiment with a subscription model that doesn't carry ads. That's speculation on my part, just based on a job post. Wow. Yeah. But but the, you know, back to your point about free email and so on. In the end, Matt, this is, this is why the book is titled as it is. I mean, I, I thought... I can tap dance around this thing, you know, I can sort of start out in a subtle way and hint 
about you know privacy and all of this other stuff that we're concerned about. But I don't know, that doesn't really work for me. And I've not had success with that. I'm a bit too... I'm just a bit too direct. So I just decided to fully embrace my directness. I'm going to hit people over the head with it. Here it is, folks. Free is bad. It's a universal <laughs> rule that you can apply to anything in life. <laughs> that is great. That is great. Well, you know, on that, just for a moment here, John, now that you've made that bold proclamation, I think it's time to take a break and thank our sponsors for underwriting the cost of hosting and delivering this podcast to us. If you are a regular listener of Endless Coffee Cup, well, you know I love coffee. If you are listening for the first time, then the name of the podcast should be a big clue. I love conversation, and I think that we have a lot to learn from each other if we only take the time to sit and talk over a cup of coffee. Maybe we'll come to a resolution, maybe not, but at least we've learned from each other. It's in this spirit that I'm happy to announce a regular sponsor of the Endless Coffee Cup, a coffee sponsor. In Care of Coffee is a coffee company that is unique in the market. They are directly tied to the communities that produce coffee and ensure that the proceeds go to the coffee farmers, the local producers, and their communities. There are no middlemen or markups. The proceeds from the sales go directly to the communities that work so hard to bring us the enjoyment of a great cup of coffee. Go to incareofcoffee.com, follow the link in the notes, and use the code ENDLESS to get 10% off your order. Again, that's the discount code ENDLESS to get 10% off your order. I'm enjoying the whole bean Weiwei Tenango coffee today. Please support our sponsor and know that your support goes directly to the farmers, producers, and communities that help power us here at the Endless Coffee Cup podcast. Hey, thank you very much, listener, for dealing with the word from our sponsors. And uh, <laughs> I felt so hypocritical making a break for an ad break after we're talking about free is bad. And yes, podcasts are free, but I, I think there's a different level there. There's a different scale. We're not talking about uh, invasive ads you know, at a massive scale. It's One thing I love about podcasting is it's individuals who are bringing us very focused, centralized, I, I would say very specific knowledge and uh, or entertainment. And you can tune in, you can turn off, you know, it, it, it's it's a little different. So that's my justification for it, John. <laughs> perfectly okay. It's perfectly okay. I mean, I think the economic intent here for, for your listeners, Matt, is clear, right? And so th there are definitely, although my book is titled Free is Bad, there are definitely situations where the statement is not completely true. I mean, I say it to be a little bit prov provocative, but I think the canonical example where it's not true is Wikipedia, right? Ah, great example. Yeah, it's free and it's good. Uh, and I think the difference there is that with Wikipedia, there is not a customer with subversive intent. That's really the difference. Mm -hmm. So with, with a lot of the online ad systems, and particularly um, the way that Google operates its online ad systems, the, the connection to the advertiser is not really policed by Google. Google takes a very hands-off approach with that. So you can end up with some pretty nasty stuff coming through on the ads because Google doesn't want to get involved. They don't want to have to be policing that stuff. And, and so therefore, you know, the customer, which is the advertiser who is paying for the stuff, you know, whatever it is that you're consuming online, that easily can be bad. It, it, it can be okay, but because Google is not policing it, it easily can be bad. Now, conversely, I think with Wikipedia, the customer, let's imagine for a moment, who is the customer of Wikipedia? Well, it actually turns out the customer of Wikipedia is the reader. And although Wikipedia mm. is free, there isn't an advertiser with bad intent. Um, in fact, Wikipedia relies on donations, you know, and Jimmy right. Wales has been very clear about that, that <laughs> he doesn't want to take advertising money because it would distort 
no articles. And I think that's just, it's just obvious that that would happen. Right. So, although I make the statement free is bad, there are some edge cases and Wikipedia is one. And I got to say, podcasts is another because the form of advertising is uh, clear and straightforward and non-subversive. Mm-hmm. Well, and you make this point so excellently in the book, and you, you, you brought this up, and, and I want to dive a little more deeper into it. It's my customer. My customer is the listener. My customer is not the advertiser. And that is what you roll into your analysis of search and of news and email of uh, who is the customer you know whoever has these services so we've been we've been hitting google pretty hard on this you know of gmail of search who is the customer and and you turn it on its head and you you expose who the real customer is and it's not the end user right Right. I mean, I, I, this was just based on my experience, Matt, of, uh, of running businesses. You know, I, I, th- I thought back to the days, you know, like, uh, I don't know, set market motive, right? We're selling training courses there. And, uh, you know, just thinking about the, we've got these customers and every day we, we go into the office and remember those days we go into the office oh, yeah. um, <laughs> and we would, we would think about, uh, you know, well, we got to work on this. We got these customers and we'd have sales meetings and we're thinking about the customers and just everything, everything that happens at the company is naturally, there's nothing wrong with this, is naturally focused on keeping the customers happy. Yeah. So what happens if you are creating something like, say, news? Let's just, right, let's stray into a different area here. Let's talk about news media. What happens if you're creating news and that news is uh, is online and anybody can come along and read it and that news is funded through ads. Mm-hmm. And those ads are, you know, they're, they're online ads. They're not sponsorships. They're very much, you know, trans- transactional ads. That company, that news company, is going to do exactly the same thing that I did at my companies. It is going to wake up worrying about its customer. What can it do to keep the customer happy? How can we get more of these customers? How can we get more money out of our customers? The whole machine of the business revolves around the people sending in the checks. And of course, at a news organization, unless that news organization is built, is built on subscriptions, at that news organization, that's going to be advertisers. Yeah. I mean, actually, by a th- strange twist of fate, for an awful lot of news organizations, it turns out that that's Google. I mean, it's Google who is supplying the biggest checks to, for those ads. So everything that the business does is an economic decision, and it is based on keeping and acquiring happy customers. And everything else takes a backseat to that. Absolutely. and. You know, the added twist to this, especially when we talk about news, is, yes, it's Google writing the checks. uh, But if that news organization is a corporation, well, now I've got to keep the investors happy and by producing profits. And so my background is journalism. And my journalism professor always, always was stressing the division of editorial and advertising. They should never meet, never mix. There should be a clear distinction. And, you know, we studied, you know, this was back when newspapers were, (laughs) you know, newspapers and televised news. And we studied that of how they would delineate that. But we also studied how entertainment was making its way into news. Back in the, you know, 80s and 90s, you started to see shows like Entertainment Tonight. And this fulfills, you know, I'm going to go to Neil Postman, where, you know, he even said when television is breaking news apart into entertainment. And so very soon, entertainment will be news and news will be entertainment. And that's what we started to get with these news light entertainment shows. And we would analyze that to see, you know, where's the advertising? Where's the editorial? What's happening to the editorial based on the advertising? And you could see how the influence of advertising would change the editorial direction of an organization. 
and now that we're online, you can see where I, I would like to say pre-internet, you had to monetize the news organization or the news medium as a whole. So what I mean by that is the only way I could affect the news is I could buy an ad at the beginning of the news or in the middle of the news or at the end. Uh, with a newspaper, I could buy a full page layout. I could put something in the classifieds. But now that we're online, I can monetize an article by itself. And if that article gets a lot of clicks, now I'm monetizing and I can see what people are drawn to. And now all of a sudden, this is where for me, you know, with that background, it, it hits an ethical issue of I can modify that headline or modify that link to make it more attractive, to make it more sensational. And in doing so, I make more money. And that makes more money from the, the customer, which is ad revenue, but it also makes my investors happy from a corporate standpoint. And, and we're seeing it today, the effects of that, it changes the editorial direction. Oh, totally, totally. I mean, um, uh, the, the, the phrase I use, forgive me, I, I invented this phrase, and I, I'm not sure that it works in all cases, but I think it's largely true. I think it's largely true. I, I use the phrase for newer news organizations. I call that neo-news. Yes. They're born online, and they have an online way of thinking about news. So optimizing the way the news reads, continuously testing, dividing articles up, making articles more emotive, because um, if you make them emotive, uh, they attract people more. Yes. Um, and then really the thing that's pumped steroids into all of this is social media. If you start out with articles that are free for everybody to read, right? It's just It just lives online, it's free, and it's funded entirely by ads. Then you've sort of, you, you've taken any words that, that might have had truth in them at the beginning, and you put them through this optimization cycle of testing and uh, experimenting with different stuff, injecting emotion, and then you make it possible for people to share it on social media. And of course they can share it because it just lives on the web, it's free, right? Right. <laughs> so the free stuff, is just so prone to the business working as hard as it can to satisfy its customers. I mean, I'm, I mean, I'm going to be a little cautious here about straying into ethics, mm -hmm. um, because although I think that's a problem, it's, it's something that can't be quantified. You know me, I'm just this total analytics nerd. And I, <laughs> I, I, I'm naturally drawn to things that can be quantified. I find them easier. My brain works best with things that can be quantified. So you've got one business. I call these businesses Neo News. And um, if you want to think about a name for a, a publisher here, I don't want to name names, but we could call those guys Opinion Facts, right? The yeah. brand. You can imagine the brand of the news publication here is Opinion Facts. And it's pretty obvious that putting that stuff out there for free makes the whole machine work super efficiently, you know, and the customers, i.e. the advertisers, are really happy with that. Now, the other side of it is news publishers that came before the internet, I call these guys classic news. So in order to distinguish them from neo news, I call these guys classic news. And their biggest problem is that they probably don't have articles which are out there on the public web. They're dependent on subscription revenue. And so their articles sit behind a paywall. So you can't share them on social media. Right. And if you can't share it on social media, well, then, you know, the emotion thing just isn't so important. And so if the emotion thing isn't so important, well, then we kind of can't drive all of this ad revenue off it anyway. So you've sort of got these two feedback machines in these two worlds, in Neo News and Classic News. And the feedback machine in Neo News just keeps getting louder and louder and louder. It's positive <laughs> feedback. It's just going off the scale. And then in Classic News, well, they're kind of stuck behind the paywall. It's a bit dull. I call these guys dull evidence, by the way. Um, <laughs> 
it, you know, it's a bit dull. And but but like, wait a minute, isn't that what news is supposed to be? I mean, isn't suppo news supposed to be evidence, logic, and reason? And isn't that like really really dull? How do you possibly get emotion into that? How do you drive the machine round and round using emotion with that stuff? And what I realized, like the big epiphany here, is, oh yeah, one of these is free. And one of these you have to pay for. That's the difference. <laughs> That's great. Well, that was what I walked away with, that real news is boring. I mean, that's, <laughs> let's be honest. And, and, and that's where, you know, I appreciate my, my father and my parents. The upbringing is, you know, if you want to understand something, and, and this is what you did with your book, you've got to go back and look at the history. Mm. You, you can't understand a conflict around the world with a 20-second news bite. Because all they're going to tell you is this happened, this many people died, this country did this. And that's what you get in 20 seconds. But to understand why those things happened and what the foundation of this is, well, you need to go back into the history. You need to understand the conflict, the, the people, the situation. And that's boring because it, <laughs> it, it, it requires you to invest time and effort to study and learn. Now, when you see this happened, you have a context to interpret that by. But without the context, well, it's just information. Yeah. And yeah, so it's it's boring. It requires you to work. <laughs> <laughs> and and yet it it mirrored so so clearly the kind of conversations that I had with businesses related to the analytics product, mm, you know, yeah. I mean, going back, you know, going back to the sort of the origin story here, uh, you know, when, when we met 15, 17 years ago, um, click tracks, the analytics thing, I, I spent so much time using the evidence gathered from the online analytics and convincing business people that their preconceived ideas here were wrong. Now, one of the what it actually it wasn't quite as bad as as what you might assume because one of the things that separates people who are successful in business is that they tend to be pretty good at suppressing their preconceived ideas and just you know implicitly they tend to be open to evidence that comes from outside their their experience and, and outside their worldview. But there are plenty of people who are not open to that. And, you know, in business, one doesn't encounter so much of that. But it's a real uphill struggle, <laughs> trying to move that kind of uh, that kind of thinking across the line, right? And, you know, oh. No amount of evidence is going to change somebody's <laughs> mind in some cases. Well, I do a lot of international training and it's and it's always very interesting because I run into that audience where you know, especially I would say parts of the world where you know, you and I grew up with PCs and that's where we started and then we had email and then we had search and then we had these things added on, then we had mobile. And I'm going into parts of the world where well, they started on mobile. And because they started on mobile, Facebook or Instagram was where they started. Mm -hmm. And just search email, that type of stuff that was always been around. But they are focused so totally focused on social media is how I'm going to build a business. And then I go in with my course, and I start showing them the analytics, and explaining the difference between, well, social media, yeah, it's great. It's free. It's a great way to expose your business and, and get some eyeballs, but that's not your audience. That, that audience belongs to that platform. They're renting it to you. <laughs> and, and, and now all of a sudden, and then when I start telling them, no, you, what you want to do is drive people to a property you own and that you acquire their email. They become your customer and you can talk to them whenever you want. And that's the difference between buying and renting an audience. And now, then when I start putting it in those financial terms, that, yeah, social media is free. You could use it all day long. But when you start investing in your own property and bringing people there, now that audience belongs to you. And there is a learning curve 
And now all of a sudden, people they're starting to see, oh, so I have to, I, I'm working with businesses, and they're coming to that realization, I have to build a website. And so it's interesting to kind of now be again, kind of going through what we went through in the early 2000s, and even maybe a little earlier. And now I'm experiencing this in other parts of the world of, yeah, we have to use this evidence to persuade people that look at what you can do. And free is not going to get you there. That's so interesting that um, yeah, Facebook has just come to dominate people's uh, consciousness, you know, for for some people, Facebook is their source of news. You know, that is a true statement. For some people, Facebook is where they get their news. Now, I, actually, I have to qualify that a little bit because Facebook has actually introduced a news feature. And it's, it, you know, we're not talking here about memes that people toss around, right? <laughs> what? <That's> there, is <laughs> actually, there is actually a button inside Facebook, which is, which is labeled news. And it um, is sourced from credible evidence-based news organizations of the type, Matt, that, you, you know, that you're familiar with from your, uh, from your uh, training, right? Your, yes. your early education, you're familiar with those guys. And so, you know, Facebook has some of that stuff inside the platform. However, however, I think it's true to say that just about everybody ignores that. Right. Um, and they rely on memes. <laughs> right. Yeah. Wow. Meme-based news or, or the, the meme economy. I, <laughs> <laughs> I I am so frustrated with it. It, 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 it and, and that's a thing. It just it reduces nuance to a binary choice. It reduces information to a joke. And, and many times it relies on irony that eliminates almost any conversation that could happen. Yeah, unfortunately, you, you are right. That's I, that's where people get their news, and it makes me cringe. <laughs> <laughs> What would your um what would your professor, right? Thinking back to your course, you, you mentioned before your professor, what would your professor say to this? You know, I am trying to get her on a podcast and she does not want to be on it. <laughs> she she is this is not her chosen medium. <laughs> That's... That's so funny. That is so funny. If you if you succeed, you absolutely have to tell me because I want to hear that. Oh, I, I am trying so hard. I I you know, right now she is chancellor at a university. And so uh, she is still in the educational system. And I'm, I'm, I'm next going to have to rely on bribery. I, I think that's my next step. Uh, <laughs> so I got, I got to ask you another question here about, um, about news. And this is, this is uh, a little um, topic that um, I think is, is super, super important. The city where you live, in Ohio, you, you live in you live in Canton, right? Yes. What's happened to your local newspaper? Oh, it is, I believe, a subsidiary of the New York Times, and so it's a little bit of local, a lot of national and world, and the readership has gone down very, very significantly. I think on a Sunday paper, you'll probably get the most local news. And then now I will say they online, they, I believe, give you two articles and then it's firewall. So there is a little bit of a local presence. And we actually have some smaller local papers, uh, even outside of Canton in some of the smaller communities. I won't say they're thriving, but they're still existing and they are still trying to report local information. I mean, I, I think that's encouraging. Local news is a really interesting business because um, got squeezed by the internet uh, pretty significantly. Um, but we could kind of see a way forward there. Mm -hmm. um, but local news got squeezed. In fact, squeeze is, is, is an understatement. They all got <laughs> crushed by the internet and by Craigslist. Right, yes. Craigslist came along with the with the and and swept away all of that easy business with classifieds and real estate listings and your rentals and cars for sale and all that stuff. So a lot of communities uh, are now have no local news presence, and that's a real problem because you know local politicians, in some ways, are harder to hold to account. Mm -hmm. Because the institutions that that would normally keep them um, accountable are not strong. And so you're often dependent on journalism 
to, uh, you know, ask difficult questions from time to time. And that's kind of going away. It is. And I'm glad you brought that up because so many people are consumed with politics and news at a national level. And I don't think they realize that your local politics, your local issues are going to affect your life more on a daily basis than who's president. (laughs) And I I believe the number is it's close to 70 percent, I believe, of people who listed journalism or journalist as their profession in the last 20 years. I think it has dropped by 70 percent how many people were employed as reporters. That's how much the the Internet has taken over. And a lot of newspapers just republish press releases. And I think the value of local news and information has diminished in a lot of people's minds. That's what you got from newspapers. You know, the one thing, you know, another piece of action. That's one thing I liked about your book. There's a lot of action you could take. And one thing that I would add to that is subscribe to a local newspaper. Find out what's happening locally because that's what affects your schools. That's what affects your local regulations. That's what affects, you know, a lot of the services around you. And if, if you're ignorant of it, then how do you know where to go to change it? Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's exactly it, Matt. That, that is, that's exactly it. We have in, in, in the town where I live, um, Santa Cruz, uh, you know, we're in um, North California, just outside Silicon Valley. We have a local paper, the Santa Cruz Sentinel, you know, which is just dying on its feet. Mm. I mean, and, and, and I, I don't know that I can say with a clear conscience to anybody that lives here, hey, you should subscribe to the Santa Cruz Sentinel. I mean, I, I, I would feel bad doing that because it's terrible. And, <laughs> and the website, I mean, like you, you, you sort of can't go to the website because it's just so dreadful. And these big blocky graphics, it doesn't render properly on mobile. I mean, oh, you, no. you know, there's all these problems with it. And I, I, I don't think I would feel good about saying to everybody, anybody that you know lives in this little town, hey, you should subscribe to that thing to keep it going. But, but we have two other news organizations that have recently started. One of them is called Santa Cruz Local. And the other one is attempting to go national. There, there is a sort of a, um, a syndicate slash franchise model. And I think that is called Lookout Local. But both of these are Um, startups that are staffed by young people and they are online only there is no wood pulp slurry that's being delivered to people's (laughs) front doors right that's the thing of the past they're online only and they are dedicated to offering the kind of journalism that local issues require Mm. And they had a, I was so interested in this when I uncovered these, these two companies. And it just, it's just so happens that they're in the town where I live. Okay. The town where I live, we are sort of blessed with a high population of people who are driven and creative. I mean, it's the kind of town that, uh, that we have plenty of that. So that, and young people, yeah, we have young people too. All of that helps. But the thing that really encouraged me here is that both of these organizations um, have dedicated themselves to local reporting on real issues, and crucially, they are taking only sponsorships, and they call it membership. Ah. Yeah, they, and they both use that word. So they, in order to get any amount, of any reasonable amount of local news delivered to your mobile device... And it comes by email, by text. I mean, they do reporting by text, right? You wow. can get news from them via, that's how forward thinking they are. Mm-hmm. But you need to be a member. And I thought, this is so interesting. They're using that word. Doesn't that word sound better than you need to pay? Yes. I mean, oh, <laughs> right? it brings in the mentality of investment that I'm investing in a local resource rather than... I'm paying some faceless entity somewhere. You, you know, I think that, that, that that's very well chosen. Yeah, yeah. It puts a human face on things. I mean, these are these are um, startup companies and they're not, you know, part of Gannett or um, Knight Ridder or, or uh, you know, these, these big publishers. You said that your local paper is owned by the New York Times. There are those big, they're public companies. They've got, 
they've got problems they need to solve that you and I just can't imagine. Um, <laughs> these are you know these are local smaller local companies, and I am actually really optimistic that in our local communities, this kind of ethical uh, reporting can thrive, and that enough people that care are willing to pay and be a member. I mean, they're, they're using that word membership. Mm -hmm. we're, we're willing to subscribe. Because I just can't see how this can work if it is entirely dependent on ad revenue. And by the way, my evidence for making that bold statement, I don't think this can work if we're entirely dependent on ad revenue. The reason I think I can make that statement is we've been entirely dependent on ad revenue. And look at the mess we're in. Right. And I don't think people realize the division, the clickbait headlines that drive division, that drive drama, you know, everything that's shared on social media that drives to free news. I don't think they realize that how much that supports an ad revenue model. And this is where it leads. You know, I think uh, 20 years ago, we were on the cusp of, of looking at the internet and everything that was possible. I don't think anyone predicted where this was going to go. And it has created this fractured, angry society. <laughs> and if anything, it's more of the science fiction dystopian future that is typically predicted in <laughs> science fiction, rather than look at what we can accomplish and, and look at what ad revenue could do is I, I, I think I mentioned this to you before, but I think it has been a bad trade off. And the, the argument has been, well, if, if people will want free if we can track you and deliver better quality advertising. I, I don't remember signing that agreement. And <laughs> I, I, you know, I don't remember a survey, but that seems to have been the unspoken line that, you know, Google, Facebook, a lot of the big players have made that line that people want better targeted ads, and they're willing to give us more information. In order to use these free things, the exchange is advertising. And that's been a terrible trade. Well, you know, just to say it again, right? Remember the founding phrase of the internet, information wants to be free. And we said that 20 years ago. We kind of said that to ourselves. And what we then did is set about putting in place all of the economic incentives to make sure that that remains the, the case, mm. right? We, we, we said that to ourselves, information wants to be free, and we just made sure that that would be true. So now I will tell you where the phrase comes from and who said it to whom and what the other half of it is. There's two versions of the phrase. And if you, if, you, if you look at the Wikipedia article, you'll see these two versions. But the first, the simple one, was said by a guy called Stuart Brand. And he was the founder of the um, Whole Earth Catalog, uh, sort of an uh, information age pioneer and philosopher. Hmm. He said, information wants to be free. Information also wants to be expensive. That tension will not go away. Wow. Uh, now, that's the simplified version. The actual original one is even more nuanced and interesting. And the interesting thing here is that this was Stuart Brand again, and he said these words to Steve Wozniak, the co-founder of Apple, in 1984. All right? So in 1984, there's a big conference called the Hacker Conference. Uh, Bill Gates was there. He was in the audience. Stuart Brand, Steve Wozniak was there. A whole bunch of people. 1984. And this is what he said. On the one hand, Information wants to be expensive because it's so valuable. The right information in the right place just changes your life. On the other hand, information wants to be free because the cost of getting it out is getting lower and lower all the time. So that's it. Hmm. Information wants to be free. Information also wants to be expensive. That tension will not go away. Hmm. It's interesting. I, I really like that. I'm going to go dig that up. And, and I will tell you, my first thought, though, is we have so much information available to us, yet the quality of the information is, is suffering. 
you know, I, I feel like those of us in the search engine optimization industry owe the world an apology. <laughs> because from the earliest conferences, it was clear that in order to rank well in Google, you have to become a content developer. You have to write content in order to rank for those words. And then that content, you know, you publish more and more, you put it on social media. And I think that has been one of the, the most significant drivers of poor, irrelevant, it's content for content's sake. I, I remember being at one of those conferences and someone from the platform was saying, just write content, just put out content. And and someone in the audience, I, I they were behind me and I heard them groan and they were just saying, can we have good content, please? <laughs> <laughs> but it, that's where I feel like we have to apologize for this glut, this over uh, overabundance of low quality information. And that's what's free. Yeah, Matt, your your observation here is dead on, right? There is there is no question that quality of information is lower. All right. I think we can make that statement and we know it to be true. But I ask you just for a second here to refine the statement. Is that statement true for information that you pay for? Hmm. As far as the quality? The quality. Is the quality of information that you get lower among information that is paid for? I mean, right, we can say when we go online, there's stuff out there that's not good. There's fake news. Mm -hmm. There's right, there's all these other problems. Yeah. And that didn't exist 20 years ago. Right. Now, it is my it is my observation that the quality there has declined among free stuff. Yeah. But the quality among paid stuff has remained just as good. I haven't seen a noticeable decline there. And and of course we 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 read I'm sure we read different things. Trade journals, mm -hmm. news, I mean I'm sure that we read different things. So have you seen a decline in quality among content that you pay for? No. I just I told someone the other day, I read more books than blogs because it's more work for the author to write a book than to write a blog. And I get more information. The context is higher. Uh, there's more work in reading a book than reading a blog. You know, and a part of it too is my choice of what books I'm reading. Uh, but no, for, the, for what I am paying for, because there's no incentive to cheapen or get more clicks among information and, and media that I pay for. Yeah, that's exactly it. The economics of the whole thing work correctly for you. Yeah. <laughs> right? You're the customer. The, the economics is just completely straightforward. You buy the book and it works and you, you get value from it and away you go. Um, that type of thinking, that's why I started to just realize, hey, look, wait a minute, folks. We're, you know, we're, we're getting worked up over, like, let's say, fake news, right? It's a thing. No question. It's a thing. But I don't see it. Mm. I mean, I am not experiencing fake news. Right. And so what's the difference? Why is it that, that it's not part of my life? And it seems to be part of other people's lives. And that's when I realized I'm paying for all of my news. No exceptions. And you are most likely using social media for a specific purpose rather than filling dead moments with it and going there every day and maintaining a profile. I have a complicated opinion about social media. Well, that's good. <laughs> yeah, um, I, I do. I do use um, Facebook, right? Just just to be super uh, transparent here. Mm -hmm. I've been on Facebook pretty much from the start. Many of the people that I know on Facebook are, are people that you also would know. Um, yep. Right. You know, Brett, uh, Brett Tabke, for example. Right. <laughs> yes. Um, you're a great guy. Right. You know, all, all these folks. And I enjoy my use of Facebook. Um, and actually, I would say I use Facebook once a day. Mm -hmm. I absolutely don't use it for news. I primarily use it for the cat videos and related stuff. 
in other words, for me, it's just entertainment. Yes. You know, it's it's nothing more than that. And I'm not exaggerating about the cat videos. I mean, I can I can watch any amount of those and they're hilarious. <laughs> <laughs> but I, I think that's yeah, that's where you're going with that is is you see it completely differently. You see social media, especially Facebook, as a a specific means. Yes. I'm going there for a specific purpose, and and when I'm done, I'm done. Rather than it dominating your life or dominating, same with you, I've been on, but I I probably use it maybe once every two months, and that's just to check and see if anyone has contacted me, but because I am not active, I don't think I've been active for close to eight years. My wife is the one that maintains all the updates that go out just to the family, Uh and that's all we use it for. Uh, but yeah, I'll be on LinkedIn probably three or four times a day. And I love the business focus. And But again, it's I'm not getting news from there. Uh, actually, I like LinkedIn more and more. Um, I used to find LinkedIn, you know, just interminably dull. I mean, basically, there was nothing there except resumes. But <laughs> the way that Microsoft has been building the social aspect of it, there's almost no uh, politics on that. One of the things I do on Facebook is if people start talking a lot about politics, is I I, I, um, I silence that person either. <laughs> 30 days or for, you know, for, for forever. I mean, sometimes the conspiracy theory stuff is just too funny to ignore. And, you you know, it's, you, you, but after a while that can get a bit much. So, you know, there's people that need to be pushed to the sidelines there. But um, LinkedIn is awesome. There's, there's yeah. interesting conversations around topics that matter. Um, you know, you tend to be among like-minded people. I think people in business and people in tech businesses, you know, that, that we, we tend to have a certain worldview and use of online tools that naturally brings us together and gives us common ground. So yeah, all right. I, I, I love LinkedIn and I really, really appreciate what they've done with it recently. Another thing I like about LinkedIn is that there are ways to pay for it. Yes. I mean, the, the, the business model of LinkedIn, the, possibly the reason it hasn't become the cesspool that Facebook has become for many people. I think I mitigate that myself with the way that I use it. I still get the cat videos without the <laughs> nasty stuff. Um, but, you know, I've had to work at it. But LinkedIn is not like that. And it's possible that the reason LinkedIn is not like that is that there is a way that Microsoft can make money from it that is not just the toxic ads and uh, all of that stuff. You know, you can hand over money for LinkedIn, and that's always a good sign. Absolutely. So yeah, I pay for LinkedIn. I pay the subscription there. Uh, But they've also developed that model for recruiters and job hunters, where, you know, it's almost like they they have taken over that that job recruiting and hiring. And that monetizes a huge portion of it. But yet, I, I will say of all the social services, I find so much value in LinkedIn of just being in the network and seeing some posts, using it for marketing, connecting. I, the the value proposition of what I find there is, is so much clearer and more tangible than what I find on other channels. Yeah, I'm kind of surprised. I mean, I thought um, when Microsoft bought LinkedIn, I don't know, I don't really get this. Like, how are you guys going to make money out of this? Well, all right, okay, you know, let's suspend disbelief. Right? Surely you guys know what you're doing. Um, but they really have done a good job and, and maintaining the focus on professional networking and sort of interesting professional opinions that's something that is really unique about it you get Mm -hmm. um, people with opinions that's okay there's loads of opinions out there but you get professional people with opinions about stuff they know about (laughs) and they package it up in a way that is very easy to understand i think anybody that, that has an active professional life you probably need to be spending a a little bit of time on LinkedIn every day because there's always something interesting there. I love that thing. Absolutely. And it's one of those where uh, the time you put in is directly proportionate to the value you will get out. Mm. And it's not, it's not a cold calling. Okay, please, listener, don't use it for cold calling. I think you know where I stand on this. Uh, It's there to build relationships. If you're not building relationships, you're using it wrong. That, that's the key. <laughs> that's the key because there is some spam. 
the cold calling stuff. What do they call that? Is it in mail? Is that what that? Yeah, is? that's what they allow people to do. Yeah, I. That's one of the ways, of course, they have of making money. But it's okay, you know. I'm, I'm, I'm gonna, I'm gonna tolerate that to an extent. I mean, it's right. okay. But yeah, but overall, the the network there is um is clever. It's well done. Do you, do you know anybody, by the way, Matt, that uses any of the Facebook tools? that are meant for the workplace. Now, forgive me, I can't remember the names of any of mm. them, but you know they've got this suite of things that are trying to get people to use Facebook in the workplace. Do you know anybody that uses that? I know a specialist, and she deals in Facebook advertising and a lot of the paid models there. No one's interested. Mm. Uh, a lot of it, I believe, is because of the Facebook brand. This goes back to a couple of years ago, after the Amazon Alexa was growing in popularity, do you remember Facebook came out with a home assistant? Oh, I can't yeah. remember what it was called, but from a, a graphic design perspective, you're, you're familiar with uh, dark design, right? That mm -hmm. if, if I want you to see something, I'm going to use high contrast I'm going to use bold fonts and big buttons to get your attention. Mm -hmm. If I don't want you to see it, I'm going to use a thin font that is low contrasting. <laughs> when, so we're coming up on the Christmas season, and these ads for the Facebook home device are starting to show up on television and on, on advertising, and I'm seeing a lot on YouTube. But what was interesting is they branded the device, but down in the lower corner – Facebook actually changed their brand to be less visible. And it was the, the name of the product and then down at the bottom in a low contrast, thin font by Facebook. And I, I pointed it out to my kids. I'm like, see, they're embarrassed. They <laughs> don't want you to know it's from Facebook because you won't buy it. And, and guess what we're not hearing about anymore? Uh, Facebook's entry into the market has been dismal, and I, I believe they've discontinued it. And a lot of that is, I believe, the, the mistrust that I'll give Facebook this amount of space in my life, but I'm not going to give it any more. Uh, it, it's got its place, and, and part of that, I think, uh, I think this, that, the, the phrase, know your lane, has, uh, I think, an apt description for what Facebook is trying to do in broadening its services. Yeah, yeah, that's a very, very insightful thought. I'd forgotten about that, um, that stuff that they were doing with the, um, with the device. I don't know anybody who uses their stuff in a business setting. You know, we, and we can contrast that, of course, with, um, with Google services, right? Uh. We, I think we've been a little, we've been, you know, fairly critical here of Google. And actually... I don't want to bash Google nonstop because although I don't use their stuff and I have concerns about what has happened with fake news and other stuff, which is largely funded by Google ad tech, I have to say also that they are a better player than many other companies in the ad tech world. And the corporate products they have, um, you know, if you, you know, the Google suite, G suite, I think they used to call it, they yeah, recently yeah. changed the name, they, they changed the name about every oh, four yeah. months and I yeah. can't keep up with it. But, <laughs> right. Um, I think, I think the um, second most recent name they used was G suite. If you pay for that as a business, the harvesting of the data and all the rest of it, it, it is reduced. It is reduced. So we need to give them some credit for, for doing that kind of thing. But um, when, when Facebook tries to do the same thing, you, we can say that Facebook and Google are both advertising companies and look, they've both got these business products. And we absolutely reject attempts by Facebook to have business-related products. I mean, that seems to be just a joke. Right. Google, we more readily accept that. And I think that is because Google is a better player there. They are not as they're not what I would do. I don't want to be using that stuff, but they are better than many others. I think that's because search Google search is such a foundational tool to access the web. Whereas Facebook is more that social 
you know, let's let's post things and see things. And it's not an essential business tool, whereas search, ever since the internet has been around, you know, and you make this point, what good is the internet without search? Yeah. And so because of that, I think Google is a more readily accepted business tool uh, because if we didn't have search, where are we going to find information? That could be the difference that we, um, that as business users, we more readily accept. Yeah, Google from the point of view of search. Yeah, one of the one of the, the, the most interesting things that I uncovered in researching the book was the statement from I think it was Sergey Brin, when right in the early days, you know, he said something like, "It could be argued from the consumer point of view that if the search engine is powered by advertising, it doesn't work properly," mm. because. <laughs> I mean, it's not quite what it's not quite what he said, but it, it basically wow. what yeah what he basically said is, uh, powering a search engine through advertising is obviously wrong, and um, we're going to prove it. And you're right. And so, and so in the yeah, first couple, they did of years, a great they, job of. Proving- <laughs> <laughs> no. They have done an excellent. Well, I mean, you talk about this in your book, and I, I we remember. I, I think there were conference was probably weeks after they made an announcement that paid results would be in the search results. And I, I think those, yeah, those of us in the tiny little minuscule community of search <laughs> were in an uproar. And, <laughs> you know, how dare you do that? How dare you, you know, is this the end of Google? I remember the articles and, and the questions that, you know, the ethics of Google putting in paid ads and search and, uh, well, yeah, they've proven that point, haven't they? <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Do, um, okay, so so uh, do you remember? Do you remember who they stole the idea from? I, I'm trying to think. Was it like Ink to Me? Or oh, that is a great guess. That is a great guess because Ink to Me was around in those days. Yeah, no, they, they stole it from GoTo. GoTo was a competing search engine. GoTo, yeah, yeah. Yeah, and and uh, it was GoTo who came up with the idea of businesses paying for the placement within the listing, and if you pay more money, you're near, you know, you're at the top, and so on. Yeah, that was that was GoTo, and and Google, you know, they looked at that, and I, I mean, I think they they figured out that there's probably nothing else that works for a search engine to somehow generate the money to keep the whole show on the road right yeah. and you know in the, in the spirit of full disclosure i have made the statement that i don't use a single google product um and it, it just obviously you then have to wonder okay john so like what do you use to search i mean right i mean you surely you can't go through your life without searching for stuff <laughs> and that is true. You cannot live in a Western democracy and not use search. I mean, it's the only way the, the internet and all this stuff is manageable. And the, the search engine I use is DuckDuckGo. Yep. And therefore, that immediately brings you to the next question. But wait a minute, wait a minute, John. DuckDuckGo is powered by advertising. So, you know, what the hell are you complaining about here? And the subtlety here is that DuckDuckGo, yes, it has paid listings, just as you, you mentioned, and just as Google, you know, introduced at this conference, even though behind the scenes they'd stolen it from GoTo. Yes, Google <laughs> does that and DuckDuckGo does that. But DuckDuckGo doesn't do anything else. And when I do a search, I get listings and I can click on an ad or I can click on an organic listing. I mean, in other words, the original Google search engine and DuckDuckGo as it exists today they work like the yellow pages. If, if anybody listening is old enough right. to remember yellow right. pages, you know, <laughs> there's business listings and businesses that pay, everybody's in the listing, but businesses that pay more get a better listing. And that's basically the, you know, the original Google search and, and DuckDuckGo. What happens subsequently is that yellow pages now knows which doctor you go to regularly and it knows how much money you make because it's read your emails with your tax return in it and there's all these other nonsense going right. on so we've moved pretty far from this nice little cozy world in which it's just like yellow pages it's not like that anymore but just mm-hmm. for the record 
I use search. My choice is DuckDuckGo. What about you, Matt? What do you use? Uh, like I said, a combination of DuckDuckGo or Bing to, to really, I guess, add an example. So I was helping a family member search for some medical resources and knowing that if I did this from my computer, you know, even with Bing, I'm a little bit hesitant to, this is now is going to be connected with me. And based on the medical condition, based on some of the symptoms, now if I did this in Google, oh, I, I, I can't imagine because those, those things are supposed to be covered by HIPAA, what happens between me and a doctor. But what I type into Google is sold to the highest advertiser. And so it, it made me realize that in order to help a family member, well, I turned on my VPN. <laughs> you know, I turned on my VPN, I went to DuckDuckGo, and that's where I did my research because I don't want to see ads for the medical condition that I'm typing in for the next six months. It's worse than that. I mean, those consumer medical websites will sell the visitor data even though in theory it's anonymized, they will mm -hmm. sell that visitor data to insurance companies so that the insurance companies know what people are searching for. And that data can be joined up to your personal uh, profile through the IP address. Exactly. So I have a friend who used to run a VPN company. He sold the company a while back, but a few years ago, he ran a company that provides VPN software. He went to visit a doctor. He had a fairly unusual condition. He went to visit a doctor at Stanford. And the doctor said, yes, you've got this going on. And, this, da, 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 da. and then at the end of the visit, the doctor says, now, I have something very important that you should know. Um, don't go home and Google you, this condition because what you have <laughs> is so unusual that right, it'll be tied up. And the oh. doctor then said, but if you do really want to Google it, then I recommend you use this VPN software before you do that. And he recommended back to the guy, the guy's own VPN software. <laughs> Only in Silicon Valley is that going to happen. <laughs> it's, it's absolutely straight, absolutely straight. So, you know, the, this idea that the theoretically anonymous information that you are navigating when you're doing a Google search and other things, mm -hmm. there's all kinds of ways where that can be not anonymous. And I don't want to sound too much like a tinfoil hat conspiracy theorist here. Instead, I'm just going to say that there is a strong economic incentive for many companies to start monkeying around in this stuff because there's just so much money to be made. This is not a conspiracy theory. This, you know, concerns over this stuff is straightforward economics. I, I couldn't come up with a better way to summarize the reason for your book and the reason for the podcast, John. That is an excellent, excellent way to summarize why we have to look at anything that's free with a skeptical eye. That was perfect. Yeah, yeah. Free is bad. All right. <laughs> hey, John, where can people find your book and learn more about you, too? So we uh, the website for the book is freeisbad.com, just all strung together. Oh, that's with, great. Yeah, no punctuation. I bought, bought the, that was the first thing I did is buy that domain name. <laughs> it's available on Amazon and, and in, a, uh, in the Kindle format and also in print. And I just finished recording the audio book. And that will be up on Amazon within about, you know, probably, probably by the time you listen to this, the audio book will be there as well. I also... I also, you have an exclusive here, Matt. I uh -oh. also am planning an abridged version of the book, which is meant for young people. And that is, the title of that is Free is Bad, T-L-D-R. And... <laughs> <laughs> I love it. I love it. Dear listener, I, T -L -D -R, uh, in case you don't know, is abbreviation for too long, didn't read. So that's that's why I'm loving the TLDR version of the book. That's great, John. <laughs> way, way to keep hip with the kids' lingo. <laughs> <laughs> I, tr I try, Matt. You know, what, 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 I, I do my best. Um, so the, um, yeah, the, T the TLDR version, uh, I'm in the middle of writing it at the moment. To the extent possible, 
free is bad, TLDR, will be free in an unironic sense. <laughs> nice. I love it. I love it. Well, I think the history part ought to be in textbooks. Uh, because if we use all this technology, we've got to know where it came from. And that was a lot of work on your part to put to get put that together. It was just so much fun. I mean, really, just just so much fun. You know, like telling people that there was a web concept before the internet. I mean, oh, right. Yeah. So I, I think people can just about understand that there was a time when the internet didn't exist. And therefore... <laughs> Somebody had to invent it. And it, this this guy, Tim Berners-Lee, he ha- happens to be a Brit as well. Uh, that's coincidence, of course. But no, he, he invented it. He was working in Switzerland and he came up with the idea and he invented it. But, but he sort of lifted the idea from somebody before that. And uh, I found that just so interesting to dive into that concept and, mm-hmm. and you know what happened there. So, Matt, I'm glad you enjoyed the the history stuff. I got to tell you that I loved writing it. It was just, it's just, um, you know, it was great. It was just great. Good. Yeah. Coming out of the industry, a couple of the brand names there, I, I just laughed out loud. I'm like, oh my goodness, I haven't heard that name in 20 years. That was just <laughs> so, uh, it was a trip down memory lane. So dear listener, I would strongly recommend picking up this book. It, if you've been in the industry for 20 years, you're going to find it a refreshing review. Uh, if you've not been in the industry long, this is a great way to get some roots, get a little bit of understanding about where things came from, how they came about, and, and also what has made Google the powerhouse it is today. It'll give you a great base of knowledge to work from and to understand what's happening in the digital world today and what will be happening tomorrow. So, John, again... Thank you so much. I really appreciate your time today. Oh, Matt, it's been too much fun. Thank you. Absolutely. We'll look forward to doing this again soon. And listener, thanks again for joining me on the Endless Coffee Cup.